All right, we'll go on to session two. And it is uh, indeed my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Mike Quinones, who's uh, uh, my associate for so many years, and it's an amazing uh, uh, collaboration over the years. Uh, Miguel will talk about uh, stress testing. So many types, I'm confused. Mike Quinones was previous chair of the cardiology department here. Professor of Medicine does not need an introduction, really, among the fathers of echocardiography. Miguel. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's dive right into it. Uh, sometimes we, the cardiologists, are also confused. So don't feel confused if sometimes you don't know which stress test to order. Oop, why did I, okay. So, um, you know, these are the tests that potentially we have available. The treadmill, which uses the ST changes, and then stress echo and stress nuclear that use imaging techniques. Newer kits in the block are PET, which we're hoping we'll have soon uh, for very specific indications. And then you can actually do stress with cardiac MRI. But again, those are very unique situations. And I put them on red because I'm not going to address them today because it's not the bread and butter of what we do every day. So we're going to concentrate on the first three. That is what all of us uh, at some point or another uh, will use. So what do we use them for? Well. Detection of CAD, uh, patient with chest pain or dyspnea, particularly diabetics with dyspnea, that can be angina equivalence because many diabetics don't have chest pain, they have dyspnea when they are uh, having ischemia. Uh, high risk patients, uh, checkups, executive physicians, checkups. And notice I put some question mark there because we'll address them in a minute. And then we use them also to assess exercise capacity, patients in heart failure, so we can better assess what's their exercise tolerances, chronic valvular diseases, uh, pulmonary diseases with the uh, combination of uh, pulmonary function uh, in top to everything else. Okay. And for risk stratification, patient with non coronary disease that we want to get a sense for the risk uh, and patients with heart failure likewise, uh, the stress test sometimes can help us better assess the risk also. Those are definitely with exercise. And then we have some unique situations where we use stress tests with exercise to assess hemodynamics, pulmonary pressure, pulmonary hypertension. People with dyspnea, there is now a new diastolic stress test, which we can use to try to get a sense for whether the left atrial pressure and the pulmonary pressures are going up with exercise. Again, those are more selected uses, unlikely that you will yourself order. In fact, sometimes ourselves, uh, debate as to whether we should order them or not. So my best friend just had a heart attack. I'm scared. I want to know if I'm next. How often have you heard that in your practices? <laughs> so it happens to come from a middle-aged fellow whose father actually had an MI in his 50s, uh, had uh, also cabbage. He's a little hypertensive. His lipids are not exactly the best. They would not be approved by Dr. Peter Jones. Um, so that's, but he's asymptomatic. He feels happy, he's perfectly happy, he plays golf, he doesn't have any symptoms. So what should we order? What should we order? So again, often we get confronted with this, right? Should we just do a treadmill? Should we go straight to a stress echo or a stress nuclear? Uh, should we do a CTA, coronary CTA, calcium score? Or just reassure them and treat the risk factors, which no matter what, you're going to end up doing, right? So the first thing for you to, know, to, to see is that B, C, and D are not approved by guidelines. So if you do that, good luck with your insurance company or with the patient's insurance company, all right? And I'll show you in a minute why the insurance company will give you a little trouble. All right, so what do the guidelines say in that kind of a patient? Well, there's no class one, number one, okay? They're all twos or threes, okay? So two-A, asymptomatic patients with diabetes, that's a two-A. So you can get by that one, uh, most likely. To be patient with, uh, mm, thank you. <laughs> patient with multiple risk factors as a guide to risk reduction therapy, if that therapy is going to also involve exercise, okay? Asymptomatic older men who is either going to start a very vigorous exercise program when before they were a cash potato, or they are involved in very high risk occupations, pilots being 
the very one that frequently we use. Routine checkup, the executive checkup, plus three. It's not indicated. Now, executive may pay cash for it. You know, you might feel better doing it. But let me show you why perhaps that's not such a great idea. So you already heard this. Today, we can get a glimpse at somebody's risk by downloading this risk calculator, okay? It's not perfect. In fact, there's been debates in the literature whether you know, it overdoes the risk or whatnot. But the point is, it actually is pretty easy and it works. It gives you a sense. So here we have a 56-year-old lady. She has a little cholesterol 165, HDL 46. Otherwise, she's pure okay. She has a low risk over 10 years of 2.4. If you put hypertension and diabetes, that goes to 5.7. And if she smokes, that goes to 39%. So this gives you a, get a sense, and normally when we're dealing with people that we want to do some other test, you're trying to figure out roughly that they're in about a 10% risk. I mean, that's as a general guide. If you're going to go beyond just risk reduction to a fancy test, like a stress test, roughly they're talking about a, a 10%, okay? So this is really very helpful, and you can download it uh, in the break if you want to. It's very easy to download. It's an application from the iPhone or the Google phone. Okay, all right. So points to remember when we deal with totally asymptomatic patients, all stress tests, even the Cadillac or the Rolls Royce or the nuclears, which Dr. Mamaria would try to sell you as, um, they only detect lesions severe enough to cause ischemia. They are usually 70% higher or higher, or at times between 50 and 70. Therefore, Plaques are not detected. Stress tests will not pick up a 30%, 40% plaque because it's not causing any harm. It's not reducing perfusion. Therefore, it's not causing ischemia, okay? Mm, boy. Remember, a third of MIs occur in a plaque that, that a year earlier was a plaque, and now a year later comes in as an MI, okay? Very important. Therefore, a normal stress test can give you a false sense of security. That executive goes home saying, I am Tarzan. <laughs> I don't have to do anything. I can keep eating like a slob because my stress test was negative. And eight months later, he comes with a heart attack. Okay? So that's one of the big criticisms to the stress test for executives. Okay? Okay. Also, very important point, when you have a low prevalence of disease, a positive test is likely to be a false positive, okay? If you behave and you don't fool around and you get an HIV positive test, it's likely that it's false positive, right? And then you go through a more expensive test and then that one shows that the first one, which was a screener, was a false positive. So a lot of screener tests are made to pick up things, and then you have to further go. So if you have a low prevalence of disease, a positive test, even a nuclear stress, can at times just be a false positive. Remember that. Likewise, if you have a very high prevalence of disease, classic angina, a negative test could be a false negative. So remember, that's a very important rule of anything we do in medicine, any diagnostic test we do. So calcium scores uh, are gaining a lot of popularity for that type of executive checkup or the asymptomatic patient because A, it's very quick, it's very rapid. Patient has to pay for it. No insurance company pays for it, but it's inexpensive. And it tells you already a marker, there is a plaque. Don't do it in a 30-year-old because young people still may not deposit calcium. But once you get to the type of patient we all see, 50, 50 age, 50 years old, older, if you have a plaque, 90 plus percent chance, 99 percent chance, you have calcium in it. So the Calcium doesn't do any harm. It's just a marker that there is trouble there. And now these tests have been around for 20 plus years. So there's huge database. 44,000 patients published in Jack in 2009. Calcium score of zero, which is the yellow line, they live forever, 15 years, men and women. Calcium score greater than 10, not so good. And if you get to 100, that's a worse. And if you get to 400, that's even worse. So it, it really, you have databases that tells you where, you where the patient is and where the risk. No stress test gives you that in the asymptomatic patient. 
and it works in all kinds of ethnic groups. This was done as the MESA study, whether you're Latino, African-American, Asian, good old gringo, whatever you are, this thing works, okay? The higher the calcium score, the greater the events over several years. And it works for your risk factor. So if you have no risk factor, you still have a little higher incidence if you have a positive score. The more risk factors you have going from one to two to three, the more events as you have higher calcium score. So again, you plug it in to that ACS and you really can talk to the patient about where they are, okay? And let me tell you, it's very helpful for those patients that say, well, I've heard that statins can cause uh, diabetes and can cause my mind to go crazy and, and my muscles not to work. You show them this data and they usually go home in a statin because you can just see in them very strong data of what can happen, okay? So actually, uh, in Texas, it's good to know, Texas actually passed a legislation that this screening test should be given. That was the good news. The bad news, they did not tell the insurance companies in Texas they had to pay for it. <laughs> So good luck finding one that pays for it, but it's $150. And let me tell you, I have practically never had a patient say no. Nowadays, you go to a restaurant, you spend more than $150. So it's very acceptable to patients, and, and I use it quite often. All right, now, CTAs, not approved by any guidelines. You don't go straight from a symptomatic patient to a CTA. That would not be a good equation. All right, now, in asymptomatic patients, both the nuclear and the stress echo, if I can get it on, both are approved in an asymptomatic patients if they flunk badly the calcium score. So if they come in with a calcium score of 400, yes, even asymptomatic, it's totally appropriate to follow through with a stress echo or a stress nuclear. The reason for it is shown very nicely in this slide. Once you hit a score of 40, 400 or more, you can see that 30 to 40% of asymptomatic patients will have silent ischemia, silent ischemia. And therefore, now we're talking bigger words. They may say they're asymptomatic, but they're having now myocardium that is clearly ischemic and they are at risk. So for that reason, once you hit a very high score, the imaging test, rather than the stress ECG, because you want to go straight to know how much they have. That's why imaging tests are favored over just a regular stress ECG. Okay, this is the reason you're going to have a little trouble with your insurance company, right? Treadmill ECG is a very inexpensive test. As you go to stress echo, it's, it's close to 300. As you go to stress nuclear, depending on how you do it, it's between four and $500. And there even be maybe more than this because there may be a few other goodies that may be thrown in sometimes into the test. But this is you know, from CMS, the basic rates, okay? So treadmills are going to be obviously favored by most of your insurance companies, uh, and they'll ask you, why do you need to order a nuclear? You have to go through justifications for many of these and whatnot. So actually, this was a patient of mine who had a calcium score, and he came back 3,000. He and I both fainted. <laughs> because the guy feels great. He said, Doc, I've never felt so good in my life. So I said, okay. <laughs> so, we went to do a stress nuclear, okay? And this was the EKG component of the stress nuclear. And, um, and he had a very, very positive stress test. So um, now we're going to go to patients with chest pain. So chest pain is a different story. And in chest pain, um, if the patient can exercise, particularly a healthy patient that can exercise, the pain is a little equivocal, okay? No, it's not classic. Probably treadmill ECG is the best test, even though the results are kind of mediocre in terms of sensitivity and specificity. However, the good thing about it is that it has great data for prognosis. And if patient has a low Duke uh, score, which is very easy to compute, they do very well over first three, two to five years. So it's a good test for prognosis. And therefore, it's a test that you can start with. Again, remember what I told you before about test probabilities. So it's a good test to do with somebody that has a normal EKG, equivocal symptoms, the chest pain is there, but it's not exactly classic. And if it's positive, 
you always need to go to a second test, either a stress nuclear, a stress echo, something like that, because it could be a false positive. So it's a good test because it's inexpensive, gives you prognosis because if patient does very well on the treadmill, you know they have a good prognosis. If positive, you may need to then confirm with another test. And this is something that oh, at times we get, it's a little bit of an anxiety depression with upsloping that we need to then scratch our head and say, is that positive? Is that just a false positive? And in a patient by patient, have to make a decision whether another test is needed. And that is more frequent in women. Women tend to be a little bit more in having that type of ST depression with upsloping. The one I just showed you was a woman, actually. And in case by case, you have to decide whether you say, ah, that was a false positive, or whether you move in and maybe do a stress echo or a stress nuclear. And the imaging tests are more popular because basically when in the ischemic cascade, once you start becoming ischemic, you first have flow abnormalities, then myocardial ischemia, and often EKGs are more late. So therefore, these tests tend to be more sensitive. Stress echo, we look at function during the stress. And in this patient, we see that there is a abnormal function. In the nuclear, we do perfusion, and we can quantify the perfusion and have a very detailed information about that. Both tests are relatively similar in sensitivity in terms of the patient that can exercise, the typical outpatient. Specificity has been debated in terms of whether nuclear may be a little less specific than echo, uh, but it, to be honest, this was from a meta-analysis, uh, but it's really more dependent on each laboratory. We can do pharmacologic imaging, which is very good for patients who cannot exercise. The butamine for echo and regadenosone for nuclear. So exercise should be preferred always. Do not order a dobutamine tresec or a regadenos so the patient can get up and exercise. Always, is always a better test, okay? Dobutamine should be deferred for those that cannot exercise or for preoperative risk assessment, low ejection fraction patients. The prognosis information that you get from stress echo and stress nuclear are very similar when you combine the imaging part together with the exercise capacity part. So both provide very good prognostic information. Both are approved. So you can say here that evaluation of chest pain syndrome, okay, stress echo has a lot of good approval. Stable patients who can exercise are preferred. High suspicion of CAD. High risk patients who need preoperative assessment and in low EF patient for assessment of viability. That's a little different type of thing. Beware of left bundles. If you have a left bundle, better go to a regadenosone nuclear, adenosine nuclear. Concentric LVH, beware because the butamine stress echo has a poor sensitivity with, with LVH. You may prefer an exercise or you may prefer a regadenosone. Viability is a very important area that we work with, very selective. Most of the time, by the time you get to this, you have a cardiologist helping you. Um, MPI is very similar. For MPI, the best patients, same story. We do a lot of nuclears in acute chest pain here when we put them in the chest units, very helpful. Patient with the bundle we talk about, patient with a very high calcium score, you can do either nuclear or stress echo. Patient exercises okay, always go for exercise. Otherwise, regadenosone is, is very, very good test. High risk patient for pre-op assessment, regadenosone or dobutamine stress echo, and bias more towards regadenosone. I just don't like dobutamine too much because of the arrhythmias issues, but you know, both are, are recommended. And with low EF, also you can do nuclear for viability. And you know, it's a preference between cardiologists. Some like more the stress echo, some like more the nuclear. We're doing a lot of ca cardiac MRI at this time for that. So there are special uses, such as tumor hypertension. We're not going to address them, but they can be very helpful. Valvular heart disease to assess hemodynamics. And those are situations that you're always going to be involved with the cardiologist. So I hope with this, you are a little bit less confused. But if you're still confused, hey, give us a call. We are always happy. We don't even have to see the patient. We can give you a telephone consultation and, and help you with the decision. Thank you very much.